Facebook Live. Start here. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our filmmaker Q&A on this wonderful Saturday, February 27th. My name is Sabrina Krejci. I am a staff member with the Bloy International Film Festival. We have a great lineup of films that we will be talk uh, filmmakers that we'll be talking to this evening or this afternoon. We have filmmakers from I'm probably going to butcher it. Is it by night? By night? What? Uh, we Loved Us Brothers and Takeout Girl. Um, our moderator this afternoon will be Jimmy Velasco. I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor for our Q&A events, Culver's. They have, you know, they've been a loyal sponsor for Biff for many years, so we appreciate everything that they've done for us. And I just want to take a moment to thank all of our audience members who have watched films for the last week and a half. Um, to our sponsors for sponsoring all of our events, to our filmmakers for letting us share their work with our audience, and just to everybody. <laughs> um, without our audience and without our loyal, you know, watchers, Biff wouldn't be what it is. So we've been going 16 years strong and we want to continue going. So there's plenty of ways that you as a supporter of Biff can contribute, whether that's watching and buying a ticket and watching a film, becoming a film society member, or even as low as a monetary donation. You want to learn more about how you can donate and be a supporter of BIF, you can text build up to 44321 or go to our website, BloitFilmFest.org. And with that, I'm going to start with two trailers that we will, uh, two of the three films that we'll be talking to today, I'll be showing their trailers. And I'm going to make sure. We will start off as We Left as Brothers. You guys can see my screen, correct? Yes, perfect. Okay. The right screen. <laughs> what makes you want to go back to Vietnam? It's a chance to put a close to things. You tended not to run into very many Vietnam vets when you came home. Guys just didn't talk about it. I had no clue what we were doing over there. And I think that's what was frustrating. I remember whenever I came back, being spit on. You were being told by your own other veterans, you know, of World War II and Korea, that you were somehow inferior. You didn't win your war. You didn't really interact with each other very often. It's only been later that we now get to talk. Next trailer will be for the film Takeout Girl. Focus on school. I will save so much time learning that this place has nothing to offer a young woman. Do next door fix auntie's car this morning, and I'll just cover you while you're gone. Somebody order Chinese food? Do me a favor. Take that shit to the back. I don't know who ordered that Chinese food, but your money is back there. Is it worth it? Is what worth it? Side hustle. Hey. Hey. Moving all this shit. I don't trust you, but Lalo, Lalo does trust you. What if I go to the cops? I'll burn the place down with everyone in it. You know money fixes everything. I know how to get to the cash. This is what you want, right? Now deal with it. You have no idea what you're getting yourself into. I know what Lalo's about. Take out, girl. Stay out of here. There's animals in here. They break from the leash. Please you step out the car, man? Sir, I just... I asked you to step out the car, ma'am. Wonderful, thank you. Okay, so Jimmy, it's, you're up. All right. Uh, yeah, so just to start off, I mean, I'd like to just get to the sense of 
where you guys are at in this Zoom world, uh, where you guys are broadcasting from. I am uh, broadcasting I'm, from. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, man. Uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm over here in Chicago, Illinois. Oh, Chicago, not too far from us. I mean, we're just above uh, Wisconsin, boy. Yeah, um, I was there last year. I miss it. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's a great combination of these three films today and it, uh, seeing all of them kind of uh, is a variety. I mean, there's we got a sense of documentary and uh, a narrative feature and then also a music video. Um, just to open up, Marcus, um, what, um, what kind of, what makes the production process of making a music video uh, unique and overall, like, and um, what is like the total like, experience of production, like the process for this? And then you, uh, even the, your uh, co-host can kind of jump in as well too. Yeah, Allie just showed up, this is Allie, she was, in, she was a dancer in the video. Um, the process of making a music video. Well, I mean, by name was kind of made uh, sporadically and just with friends. You know, it wasn't a uh, big crew with call sheets and, you know, uh, catering and all that stuff. It was just kind of a bunch of close friends getting together and pulling out a camera and uh, shooting something that we all wanted to make. So it, it was a four day shoot, um, short, easy days, but a lot of fun and kind of just following our hearts, going with it as we wanted to. Nice. And like, how, how was it like unique from like other work that you've worked on, I guess? Yeah. Um, well, I am fairly early in my film career, but I've done several uh, scales of production from, you know, several hundreds of people and not several hundreds, but about a hundred people and, you know, multi-camera and, you know, the whole shebang, but I've also done small things kind of on a whim and um, it's, by Nate was uh, very dear to my heart. So it's just, you know, I'm not, <laughs> I, I, I kind of lost your sense of the question there, but I've done all different scales of shoots from big to small. And sometimes it's better to go small. Sometimes it's better to just make something uh, sporadically with friends. And, you know, those actually might turn out better than the big productions with tons of planning and pre-production and all that stuff, you know, it, it really depends on what the story is and what the heart is behind it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I can imagine just uh, with a smaller group of people, there's more connect connections and a lot more uh, ideas floating around and everybody kind of heard a lot. Uh, going with like just the close like set of people and growing close to people, Evan, uh, with we left as brothers, how was it just overall uh, working with the veterans and just getting to know them throughout the whole uh, journey. It was incredible. Yeah, it really was. Um, I, uh, I hadn't met any of them up until about six weeks prior to the trip. Um, a friend of mine's a photojournalist and she was traveling over there with that group. And I had heard about um, the story of, you know, these six guys going back for the first time in 50 years. So I reached out and, saw if the uh, organization was interested in me following around with a camera. Um, and there was definitely, I think, you know, there were different levels of, of comfort between the veterans. Some were more comfortable with it. Some were, who is this guy? What is he doing? <laughs> um, but uh, over time, um, you know, I, I've grown close with a lot of them. I email, you know, and keep in touch with all of them, you know, at least monthly. And up until COVID hit, we were getting together every few months to uh, um, relive the memories and stuff like that. It's been kind of, it's been tough with COVID because most of them are in their 70s. So, you know, that's, that you have to be very careful about who they can be around. So I, I miss a lot of them, <laughs> that's for sure. But uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Definitely. I mean, just going to a beautiful country with that, like Vietnam and just uh, kind of hearing <clears throat> stories of that. Uh, troubling stories but also coming with a sense of um, acceptance and moving on forward uh, with with their journey I guess yeah um, yeah it was it was really interesting to see because I, I know that you know there were there were some that were 
Um, some of the veterans were really looking forward to the trip. Others had real trepidations about going back. And, and what was so interesting to see is, you know, a few of them, almost as soon as they landed, they could feel like, you know, a sense of, you know, almost dread. Like it was just so strange being back there and they had so many troubling memories tied back to it. But to watch that kind of wash away over the three weeks that we were there was, was really interesting to see. That's all. That's all. That's amazing. Uh, and I really enjoyed kind of just getting the history from them and just uh, their real life experiences and just how t like terrifying some moments could have been for them in the past. Um, uh, Hassani, um, how was uh, your cast and crew? Because I mean, there were a bunch of scary, some, some of them were pretty scary on screen. How was it working with all of them? And how did you get to like meet, uh, know them and um, get them involved? Uh, well, good question. Uh, most of the cast and crew are just friends of mine. People I've been working with for a really prolonged period of time. Uh, uh, a lot of the cast, I wrote their parts for them. Um, Takeout Girl was uh, a passion project. We had practically no money. Um, and it really ran off of uh, our lead actress, Hetty Wong, who is my co-writer and obviously lead actress and producer of the film. And then Alberto Triana, who is my co-editor, my co-cinematographer and producer of the film. And then uh, Melissa Del Rosario, who is our uh, producer and a bunch of other key crew parts. We all had to work multiple positions on the film. And uh, I think we shot for, we I had enough money to pay a crew to help me for about 14 days or 15 days. And uh, the remaining uh, days, uh, the remaining 25 days were just Alberto, myself, Hetty, and uh, Melissa, uh, all working for free, just making it happen. Uh, we shot in Las Vegas, Nevada. And in, we shot during the summer, which was my mistake. But a sign that everybody bonded really well is we kept laughing. We had a really good time. Uh, I felt comfortable cutting days short when it got too hot and the crew worked too hard or worked, you know, they were working overtime uh, because I knew we had such a bond that we would get it done. So it, it felt really good working with everybody. We're kind of like a film family now. That's great. That's awesome. And I mean, they, the development of the, the these characters in there and just like they're, they're all just different ranges of uh, intensity. Just walking in the back room of the comic book shop is just a different analysis of like just different directions everywhere. Um, but yeah, going with the just influences like for Marcus and Asani, uh, Evan, you could jump in too. Like what are some kind of influences that got you rolling with this project and um, you wanted to get this shown to people? Uh, after you, Marcus, go ahead. <laughs> Thanks. By the way, your film is awesome, man. I haven't finished watching it yet, but uh, I'm about 30 minutes in and uh, it's really captivating. So ah, thank you. Thank can't you. Wait, can't wait to finish watching it, brother. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it, inspiration. I mean, Allie, do you want to talk about like, like your like inspiration for dance or anything? Like, um, yeah. I mean, I think that this story was um, something that we both had a really personal connection to. So it was easy to find um, a very personal inspiration for the movement in this piece. And we also had spent a lot of time talking about um, Jen, the other actress, and what she was going through and how that was reflected in the music and in me. And also, I think really what inspired this was heartbreak. <laughs> <laughs> and so it's like a very universal feeling, um, but we all experience it so deeply and so hard every time and in a completely unique way to ourselves. So that was really where I came from. Yeah, yeah, there's three aspects to it. There's the song that's used, which is Copernicus by Par for, for Cuba. There's the dancing, the, the, the contemporary dancing element, and then the narrative story together. And uh, I wanted to tell like a hybrid between contemporary dance, a, a contemporary dance film and a narrative film and kind of evoke the, or use the contemporary dance to evoke the emotions 
that the main character of the narrative was feeling. So Allie and I have been friends for uh, se several years now, and she's a phenomenally talented dancer, and I just felt like the collaboration had to happen. <laughs> I love that answer, by the way. That was dope. <laughs> um, for me, I'd say my inspiration were the people involved, uh, starting with my lead actress, Hedy Wong. She came to me with a first draft of the script and the premise. But when I met her, like Hedy Wong is, she's obviously so much more complex than the character she plays in the film. But the fact that she had elements to her natural personality that matched that character, I had never seen a woman who embodied that sort of power before. Um, so it intrigued me. It let me knew that I can make a film about her like jumping rope or playing hopscotch for 90 minutes and it would be a good movie. Um, so, and um, my, my producers, my cast, my crew, it's kind of like when you're making an indie film and you're not connected in Hollywood, everyone's true ambitions are such like, so taboo to share, but you know, deep down inside, everyone wants to maybe have a career at this. Everyone wants to do this for the rest of their lives. And I knew that. So I was inspired by everyone's inner secret goals. The fact that, the, that maybe I could be a good enough leader to make a film where everyone would be able to continue doing this. Everyone can get their next job off of this film. And to try and meet those expectations really brought out the best in me. So my cast and crew inspired me. Nice, wonderful. Yeah, I mean, these are great influences too. Uh, one other thing also, like, I mean, you guys all have backgrounds and long backgrounds in film and um, creation of films and stuff. Uh, and, you know, your previous works before, how have you noticed that, like, your own work kind of influences your new, like, your projects now? I know, Marcus, you had uh, the feature film Sun King last um uh, last year in 2020 and uh, Biff showed it and I've heard wonderful things about it. I've been meaning to look it up on uh, Film Freeway, but yeah, uh, just like kind of overall, what are your guys' like uh, takes from your past film uh, filmography and then using it to your advantage now, I guess, yeah. Evan, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, so uh, my first chance making a feature was uh, like a narrative low budget horror movie. And we got the, we had the, the um, fortune of being able to make it with someone else's money, um, you know, and what I learned from that is sometimes that can be a good thing. And sometimes that can be a bad thing. You know, there, you get a lot of luxuries by being able to, um, you know, have more crew and more time, but um, sometimes you have to make creative decisions that are beholden to that you know the fact that we want to make money that we want it to be more commercial so um after i had finished my first film i was kind of like well this doesn't feel like a true expression of what i wanted to do um so when i set out to make another movie i didn't care what size of the movie that it was i just wanted it to be mine and it to be something that i could stand behind and say this is my vision, I made this um, and feel good about it. So um, that's kind of, it was a tough learning experience, but it was a learning experience that I'm really happy that I went through. And um, I would say that more than anything is, you know, when you're getting into a project, you need to make sure that everyone from, if you have a financial backer, your producers, or like you said, your cast and crew, that you all have a unified vision of this is what we're doing. This is why we're doing it. Um, and, you know, whether you're working on a bigger or smaller budget, I just think that the end product, if you can walk away from it and everybody involved feels good about it, then it's a success. Amen, brother. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> oh, I love your film as well. Both yeah. of you. Thank you, Jimmy. I can't, I can't wait to uh, check yours out, Evan. Uh, great question, me. Jimmy. Like, uh, Evan, I think I'm very similar to you in that sense. Like, I, when it comes to the, my personal motivation and inspiration and reflecting on older projects, 
uh, it's always been the same. Actually, it's been the same beyond even film. It's, it, it, was, it goes back to my athletic career. It goes back to my academics. Um, my whole life, I've kind of had a common theme throughout all of those elements, and it's, it's poverty. Uh, poverty and growing up with a single parent in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Uh, you know, one of, Milwaukee is one of the most segregated cities in America. Uh, the inner city is just no joke. And unfortunately, that's where I had to start my journey. And when you get a clear picture of that, you feel like you're running a hundred meter race, a hundred meters behind everyone else at the start, you know, at the start. And now in my film career, my clearest goal is to see what my true potential is despite that. Like the goal is always, I always know that a lot of these films that are screening beside me had a lot of tools and opportunities and manpower that I just don't have. But can I still be on the metal stand with those great films? And, uh, if I, and, at, and, and eventually one day, can I create someone, something so solid that no one can tell that I'm starting the race from a hundred meters farther back than everyone else. I just want, I want to end my life knowing that for once that wasn't an excuse. So yeah, that's what motivates me on every project. Damn, dude, you just gave me chills. <laughs> oh, you're, I'm yeah, sure you're going to yeah. give me plenty of chills. Good, all those good looking people in that shot. You guys are... <laughs> <laughs> Man, I mean... I got to echo what both of y'all said, um, especially you, Evan, because at the indie level, I'm not quite sure if your film was made at the like indie level, Evan. Would you say so, or would you say that? <laughs> My film was made with me, a camera, and a road mic, <laughs> bumbling go. around <laughs> Vietnam, trying to trying to find a story. So there yeah, yeah. <laughs> so and then obviously, outside of yours, you just said was made with just your friends and on a shoe shoestring budget. I mean, isn't that the challenge of indie filmmaking as a director, as a screenwriter, storyteller? Is yeah, you know you love your film and you're gonna do it. You're gonna pull sixteen hour days and go hours without eating because you know that's what has to be done. But how do you convince everybody else <laughs> yeah. that needs to work on it to also do that? And that's really the struggle because. Everyone has their own agenda. Everyone has their own I ideas and visions, but it's, that's what makes film so special is you, you come across groups of people, uh, people that believe in what you're doing and the people that also see value in it for themselves. And when you can bring those people together and make something just for love of making something, that is the, that is the power of filmmaking really right there. That uh, film fam life, that's film family, man. There. <laughs> I don't know, Allie, do you, do you have anything to speak on that when it comes to like no. inspiration or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've I've definitely, like you were saying, Evan, I've I've made films that were funded by other people that were other people's work. And I do see value in that. As a director, it's important to practice your filmmaking skills, telling stories that aren't necessarily your own. Um, and that can only make yourself a better filmmaker. So I'm very thankful that I've had those chances. I'm going to con con continue to take those chances when, when they come to me, but there's nothing like a passion project. There's absolutely nothing like it. And Binate was a passion project. So it's just ultra special to have it screen at Beloit and to have people resonate with it. And, um, you know, I hope I can make a lot more passion projects with people that also feel it. So. Great answers all around for that one. Yeah. I mean, it's just about film and it's just what you want to make you know, the most out of with your filmography and just what you want to put your time and effort into. Um, uh, Evan, going back to We Left as Brothers, um, the veteran, uh, Stephen, was it? Yes. yes. Uh, at one point, he kind of compared part of his experience as like almost like a movie, experience it as a movie. Uh, and I mean, now we have like a lot of Hollywood movies uh, um, that kind of go with the whole history of Vietnam um, and one that was like recently uh, the, the Five Bloods mm -hmm. by Spike Lee and that was kind of the same premise of just the veterans going back uh, did they ever like you, the veterans you were worked with um, did they ever like share how they kind of saw these movies and like um, as you know depicting 
uh, war in Vietnam as like right, like the right way or wrong? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't think many of them. I mean, some of them just like movies, so they like those movies. Yeah. But <laughs> some of the like the bigger like canon Vietnam films, um, Platoon and uh, Apocalypse Now are, you know, made by very radical filmmakers who are going to take, you know, creative liberties over making something very factual. So I think for the most part, they felt like not many films had nailed what it was like to be in Vietnam day to day. Um, I think one of them mentioned they felt like Deer Hunter in the elements had hit certain moments that felt um, like reality. But no, they, they, for the most part, felt like, you know, it had been Hollywoodized to a certain degree. And I think it's interesting kind of how, you know, it's almost like each war that America has and that Hollywood has made films on, the films kind of take the, like the styles of the films also mimic some of the political um, machinations of the war as well, like, you know, in World War II, it's very easy to make like a heroic picture because it was, you know, very clear lines, good versus evil. Um, and then, you know, the post 9-11 war movies and Vietnam, it gets much trickier um, because of, you know, how justified either of those wars were. So I, I think that um, for the most part, a lot of those guys do not feel like they've been represented on the screen in that way. And that was kind of one of the things that I, once I got into the editing was really try to get out of the way. Uh, like, you know, not try to impose my thoughts, my feelings, my stylistic um, tendencies and be like, let these guys tell their story because this is what the story is about. So that was, some of that was motivation as well. Nice, yeah, I mean, yeah, I thought about it too. Uh kind of just how Hollywood depicts it and, you know, kind of makes it uh, a little bit more her heroism, uh, the characters in there. And uh, I just thought about it with hearing the actual, tr like, tr true stories. And, I mean, definitely it's, the war was just um, just lost on both sides. Like, uh, at one point, somebody mentioned, like, it was yeah. just all around loss at all. Yeah. Um, go, uh, going back or to the main... Um, Oh, we have some questions actually. Oh, when we're done. Um, going back to just kind of directing and editing uh, each of you guys' films, like were there some parts in post where editing it, you kind of missed out on some opportunities and you like you wish you could have done production differently? And like, what kind of, what's your kind of thought around that process and like advice to filmmakers um, who might be experiencing the same thing? You know, I'm going to dive in on this, guys. Um, really great question, Jimmy. You got me thinking. So I'm going to come right off the uh, cuff with this one. Um, I call myself a filmmaker because I, I really want to be like a craftsman with my films, just like these gentlemen uh, in, in this chat with me. You know, I, I, like I look at it as like I really want to, I want my fingerprint on every aspect of it. And I take pride in the amount of hours it takes me to get the skill to call myself a filmmaker. So, uh, but the base of it is editing. So it's funny you ask that question. I feel confident, so confident in my editing skills that just about no matter what I get, I can find a stylized way of presenting it. Um, and this Takeout Girl was a true test of that because I was working with predominantly first time filmmakers you know, again, like people who are too shy to even say what their aspirations in each position is like, uh, they're too shy to say one day, I'd love to be able to be a first AC on, on a real film or anything like that, or, or, you know, work my way up to, to taking your job even. Uh, but, you know, along with that comes spending time on set teaching. So, you know, you take some, you take a little bit of your attention away from uh, ways in which you can show off and, divert that into becoming a, a, a mentor and a teacher. And I wonder sometimes if that cost me and I wonder what I would be like if I was able to just focus on the filmmaking aspect of it. But it, it's so rewarding, it's hard, to, it's hard to say if I would want that element gone. Um, there were times when I was editing 
that I wish I had a little bit more, but I think that's just the, uh, the cross all indie films have to bear. Um, I think that's normal. Uh, when it comes down to it, I had uh, two, two uh, really good friends helping me edit this film. And that's Sam Zapian and uh, Alberto Triana. And what happened is I edited the bulk of the film. They had scenes assigned. They would pass those scenes back to me and then I would re-edit them. And then I go back to the beginning and re-edit all of my scenes. So it was such a thorough process that I feel like I didn't really leave any meat on the bone to be completely honest. But I'm, I'll tell you what, learning how to pass footage between several different editors and get everything relinked seamlessly is a skill I am a thousand percent uh, glad I have. And it, the process was worth it for that if you know that alone it's a technical challenge to definitely pass that footage across <laughs> <laughs> it's scary man it's scary um original question jimmy was can you rephrase the question sorry uh yeah um just kind of um being director and editor um seeing your creation post-production and editing it what like kind of things that, like, did you wish you like you missed out on and like you you had some um mm -hmm. you know you and you wish you kind of did things better um, not better but like just wish you added more things during production and like you know advice for filmmakers with this yeah. same problem totally um by name was a bit unconventional for me because the edit kind of made the movie um our, our first day of filming was in September of 2019. And I knew only like, it was an eight minute song or an eight minute film was it ended up being it's about a six minute song. And I only knew about what the first three minutes of the film was gonna look like. But I was, this, this whole film was just driven by uh, passion and by raw feelings. So I just shot what I could in, in that month and then edited that together and left the other half of the movie blank which usually you never want to do. Um, I probably went through over like 30 to 40 drafts of this film in the post-production process, which I never go through that many drafts before, but that's because the film kind of made itself in post. Um, I, it was like the, on the first day of filming, I had a totally different vision of what Finite was going to be. And then by the end of post-production, it was something completely different. And I kind of just let the, it come to life in the edit um, and I showed so many people uh, throughout the process to get feedback and originally the film was so uh, rooted to me personally that there was a like a legitimate uh, concern that it would just be too personal and it wouldn't resonate with a, a broader audience and you need to find a way I feel like as a filmmaker to make your stories as universal as possible while you know maintaining that personal uh, original in inspiration. So I really wanted to challenge myself to do that because I didn't just want to make a, you know, sorrow piece about what I was going through at that juncture in my life. I wanted to make something that even two years later, five years later, I could still look back at and be like, yeah, I can, I can resonate with that. So the, like the edit, uh, was so long. It like took probably six months to edit this thing. And it's only an eight minute thing. And that's because I just kept deliberating and deliberating over each cut and um, because we did it that way I was able to identify what was missing uh, midway through the editing process so we filmed like two days early in the fall and I edited that and then I realized what the second half of the movie was going to be and then wrote that down and then we filmed that and then I edited that in and then, and then combined them all together and it was definitely not how you usually want to do it but um, that's part of what makes finite special. Uh, so I don't think, I, I don't think anything left was left undone. Um, I am going to give a little shout out to my boy, Sam Howells, because the only, if, if there's one thing that was left un, undone and you might be able to notice is most of the film was shot on a D16 digital Bolex. Um, and that's my buddy, Sam Howells, his camera. And he unfortunately sold it. Uh, before we could finish shooting. Um, so we shot like 25% of the movie on a Fuji X-T3 and we tried our best to match it in post color wise. And 
I can tell the difference. Um, and I was trying so hard to get my hands on a D16 rental so we could shoot the whole thing on Bolex. And unfortunately, wasn't able to get my hands on one. So if I could go back, I would just try to shoot the whole thing while we had the Bolex and give it that uniform look throughout. But, you know, it still turned out great. So. Yeah, I was going to say yours had that kind of like Super 16 vibe like the color palette and, and everything like that. That's awesome that you shot it on a bull X. Yeah. Thank you. Um, editing. Uh, this is the first documentary I've ever done. And uh, I was not, I don't know if I was prepared for the editing challenge of like getting back from Vietnam with 40 hours of footage and being like, Oh, now I have to find a movie. <laughs> um, yeah. There's a lot. Cause I mean, I was the only camera guy over there. So in some locations, I knew we were only going to be at for like an hour. So it's like, I have to show up. I have to shoot some establishing stuff, some B-roll stuff. And then, you know, if I'm shooting B-roll and the guys are talking about something interesting, I'm not getting that. And if I'm shooting them and like, if they're having an interesting conversation as we're walking in, it's like, oh, we're leaving in five minutes. I have to get an establishing shot, a couple pieces of B-roll, blah, blah, blah. So um, yeah, it was definitely a challenge at times where it was like, I'd have a whole day's worth of footage that I'm not even going to use. And then there's like, man, I really wish <laughs> I could have shot like just five more minutes of B-roll to make this sequence go a little easier. Um, so yeah, it was definitely a challenge. And I think it, it definitely sharpened me as an editor and seeing like what kind of leeway you have with footage, you know, cause you can, um, you know, as uh, Hassani kind of alluded to, it's like, once you understand the emotional beats of your scene, you can kind of, you know, if you know what you're doing in the editing bay, you can kind of piece things together that the untrained eye may not see, but, um, you know, really make the scene work when you're maybe a little light on footage. Yeah, I mean, that's an interesting point, just like uh, the documentary style or your kind of the time crunch where you're in only certain spot at once and then compared to just like a different production, like a feature, I guess, where you could take as many takes as you want. Um, that's just interesting to think about. I mean, of course, even being in Vietnam is great to be in there, but you also want to get the job done. I mean, it's a beautiful place to be. Um, going off that, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think I've gotten most of my questions done. Uh, maybe one more uh, from Marcus, uh, music videos um, have became more of a thing. I mean, well, uh, for Biff actually, like this is like kind of like the beginning year of them actually introducing music videos into the festival. Um, have you submitted this to um, other festivals? And um, yeah, have you submitted it for other festivals? And what do you think of just about um, the uh, Biff, including music videos this year. I'm stoked that Biff is including music videos because I always, I mean, Biff, last year was my first year at Biff and you guys are phenomenal. You guys really put on a great show. You guys are truly filmmaker lovers and you're for the filmmaker. Um, so I'm thrilled that you guys are including a music video category. Um, you know, it is a bummer being virtual, um, but Binate has screened at a few other virtual festivals. Um, so I, I'm totally cool with it being, um, being a virtual film. It's also on YouTube and stuff. So, but I do have another short film that hopefully next year when Biff's is back and live again, that I can, uh, I want to save the narratives for like the in-person um, type, type action. But um yeah, I think it's phenomenal that you guys are having music videos as a part of your program, and I hope that continues. Great. Uh, that kind of ends my kind of questioning line of questioning. Um, Sabrina, yeah, do you I wanna... do have a few questions that kind of yeah. come in that kind of came in. And sorry that again that I'm really dark. I'm not a filmmaker, you guys. Like, I don't have the good lighting. <laughs> <laughs> Need a film light. I do have a ring light. I do actually have a ring light. I should have. It's it artsy, I Sabrina. I love it. I yeah. Should have put it up. You there. look so mysterious. I look like the person that interviews that wants their face blocked out. They don't want to know their identity. Um, so I have a couple questions. So for Evan, have you screened um, We Left as Brothers for any other vets or veteran organizations? 
Uh, yes. Um, so the Veterans Breakfast Club in Pittsburgh, who I made it um, in conjunction with, they were the people that I went over. We um, held a virtual screening for it. Um, it was pretty well attended. And then also our local PBS affiliate here in Pittsburgh aired it. Um, and uh, yeah, it seems to have been pretty therapeutic for a lot of, especially the Vietnam era veterans. So one of the things that they talk about in the film is there's a pretty clear divide um, of people that would love to go back and people who are so against going back to Vietnam. You know, their experiences were so traumatic. They couldn't even imagine going back at any point. And I think um, what I've heard from the VBC and from other veterans is it has changed their perception of going back and changed their perception of um you know, Vietnam as a country, Vietnam uh, as a people. Um, so uh, I think that the VBC, they're booking these tours. Well, hopefully once uh, all of this is over, knock on wood, um, the, being able to book more tours over there for Vietnam. So they're getting a lot more interest in people that want to go back to where they served and, and see the place. So would the goal with the film be kind of a wider distribution as far as maybe PBS nationally or other larger organizations kind of doing it as a educational piece even? That would be the hope. Yeah, we're working on trying to find distribution for it now and reaching out to different sales agents and, and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I'd love to get it in front of as wide of an audience as possible um, and hopefully when um, res more restrictions are lifted and um, we move towards vaccination. I would love to take the film to, you know, VFWs or different veterans organizations uh, around the country to be able to screen it. Um, and hopefully with the veterans as well that were in the film. So we actually have a great program here um, in kind of the Beloit area. It's called Vets Roll. And obviously not this past year with everything with the pandemic, but uh, there's an organization here. They take 50 some odd vets from, and every year they have a different era of that and they take them on a bus ride back from here to Washington and they see the Arlington Cemetery and all these areas. And it, it kind of, and a lot of times are these vets coming back together for the first time that are especially local ones. So, you know, the veteran community is a very near and dear to our heart here in Beloit. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and this is, so this is a question kind of going with that for each one of you, how has the pandemic either stopped or changed your style of work in the last year? So Evan, why don't we start with you? Um, yeah, it's been tough. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to put together um, some uh, projects, uh, hopefully be able to shoot a short by the end of the year. Um, it's been more time spent writing, certainly, um, and a lot less time shooting um i've been able to do some commercial work and things like that um but yeah it is difficult to plan a much larger shoot and, and do it safely um you know I'm, I'm hearing from people that work on larger productions that for some of them i think they're saying like a quarter of their budget is going towards um you know safety measures to remain safe and be able to shoot um in a way that makes sense and you know, on an indie level budget, that can be very hard to do. I mean, a lot of what we do is kind of run and gun, get it done any way that you can. And that's a lot harder to do um, given the certain, the circumstances. Nasani, what about you? I agree with Evan. Um, the kind of, uh, uh, you know, the underprivileged <laughs> films, the, the, the indiest of the indies, have a little bit of a hard time and you you know your crew my crew are scared like it's it's hard for us to even get together because if you're around one person you're unsure of you stay away from the rest of your friends just out of you know to make sure you don't hurt anyone and which means like even like brainstorming sessions that you don't want to do virtual or camera tests or anything like that those become incredibly difficult um, I have a short film right now that's been cast. It's written. I'm probably going to do another rewrite pretty soon. The bright side of this is that I've just naturally begun, like in boxing terms, they say, you know, work on your left. I've naturally begun filling in all of 
my weaknesses. Like, uh, this is my office. And I finally have an office where I can like have people watch what I'm editing without like literally piggybacking me and looking at the computer monitor. So I bought a big screen TV just for playback. I was able to round out my sound kit and, 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 and practice post sound mixing because post sound mixing was a little bit of a rough point on Takeout Girl. So there's always something for us indie filmmakers to do. And the pandemic is, it's weird how I am still uncertain because the pandemic is out there raging, but as a filmmaker, I have never been more confident of my ability to, abilities to create something better than I ever have. The skills are there because I've had the time. Uh, I've stopped being a, a cheap ass and just bought the equipment that gets the job done right. And uh, I'm closer. The quarantine, in a weird way, has gotten me closer to all of those who have been most critical in, uh, to my success thus far. And if we were doing what we were doing with Takeout Girl years ago, what what are we going to do a couple months from now if we can just get on set? So I'm optimistic. That's good. Marcus, what about you? Well, I'd echo what these guys said, but I want to let Allie talk about her experience with, with the dancing world being up on. Yeah, I mean, yeah, definitely. It must be very different for you in this world, not being able to almost perform. Uh huh. It has definitely shifted um, my focus as a dancer and has even turned me into a filmmaker myself. As have many of my dancing peers, we've had to shift from primarily focusing on a live performance to still making something that people can view safely um, at home or you know, wherever, and it definitely made me aware of how lucky I was beforehand to be privileged enough to dance in a studio. I do a lot of dancing in my living room these days, or in the alley when it's not covered in snow, and um, it's been a huge change, and we're coming up on a year now of, of doing things this way, so it's created a creative challenge. I've had to find new ways to keep myself engaged in the work um, and finding new innovative ways to keep others engaged as well. I, I think that's probably, I mean, one of the biggest challenges for whether it's a, a music artist or a dancer or a, or a dancer or even a filmmaker is during all of this, you know, some people are really, really thriving, but they're and also adapting and trying to take the different, like not letting it take them down. Like, you know, Hassani, you said you kind of, you, you went and you did it and you, you made your office what you needed. You got your equipment, right? But and there's like things where like live performances, people are adapting, they're doing them on Zoom, you know, or they're getting on Facebook Live or they're getting on Instagram Live or they're putting their content out on YouTube or on Instagram or things like that so that they're still keeping that audiences. And we've seen that from a lot of filmmakers of, you know, getting, just making themselves still using what's out there, the platforms that are available out there. So they're still getting an audience for their work. Um, another question I, I kind of had was, and you guys talked about this earlier in like your post-production and things like that, but was there ever a moment, or can you talk about a moment that you knew that the story you were trying to tell in your film, even from the documentary to music to, to you know, to a narrative was that you knew you got it right. That you got the right story that, was there like a defining moment that you're like, yes, I did it. Evan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, uh, the, the moment that I even thought that it could be a film was the moment where Andy met with a North Vietnamese soldier at the, um, the one museum. And uh, for anybody who hasn't seen the film, Andy was heavily wounded in the war. He was hit with an RPG, lost part of his jaw um he was not supposed to survive um he was able to pull through and he was one of the people that had the most um i would say um emotional stress in going to vietnam and as we got closer and closer to da nang where he served i could feel him becoming more um uh, insular and and uh you know, uh, becoming more introverted. And when he had that moment where he met, you know, the enemy, 
to him for 50 years. And um, they had been injured in the war. And uh, the, the North Vietnamese uh, soldier is hugging him and he's crying and he's, you know, he's, he, he keeps calling him soldier. And uh, that moment was, and that led like right before that moment, I had been there for probably about nine days and I was on the tarmac. We were flying from, I think, Dong Ha to Da Nang. And I was like, I don't think I have anything. I was like, I don't know if I have a movie at all. Um, and uh, it, I was getting kind of disheartened um, and, and I was really worried. But that when that moment happened, I said, that's the film. I mean, that is that's the whole reason to come here. And when there were a lot of times in editing where I was about to slam my head against the wall, I kept thinking about that moment. It's like people need to see that moment. That's an important thing. Um, and that's why I was there. Asani, what about you? Uh, I kind of felt like every day I had something special, to be honest. Um, it started with meeting Hetty. And like I said, she's like, she's like a supermodel mixed with Don Corleone. So like I could uh I could uh I could make a film about anything with her and it would be all right. And then her and I brainstorming through the screenwriting process over the phone when someone goes, yeah you know you got something because that energy popped. That happened frequently. Even if we knew we were the only ones who liked it, what other energy are we meant to go off of other than that? Yeah, especially when you know you're gonna be killing yourself for the foreseeable future. <laughs> and uh, on set, uh, like I said, we shot in the Las Vegas heat and we didn't hate each other. As a matter of fact, we grew closer, we laughed. Things would happen that norm on normal film sets, you would you would kind of be like, oh, well, well now we got it. The energy would just go down. Everyone would just go, huh, well, maybe we should do this. And we kind of listened to the universe enforcing its rewrite. And it was weird after like the third thing went wrong, which was pretty much day one. <laughs> um, <laughs> we, we got into a flow of just listening to Sounds like, like I'm talking like a Disney movie, but we started listening to the wind. Whatever we were supposed to do differently, we did it differently and the film really was boosted by that. So there's an intuition about things and the open-mindedness of the people I was working with. Actors were so into changing things. Uh, my cinematographer was so into reshooting the scene if he had to. You, you that's not normal like to shoot coverage of something, him find a new shot and then look at me like, pretty please, let me shoot two more shots from these different angles. And you know, normally you're trying to drag people through work. He's begging to do more. So like everybody was like that. Every phase was like that. And uh, every step of the way, I felt just so much more responsibility to push this to the finish not necessarily, it sounds weird, not necessarily for the audience, but because of the commitment everybody made, the excitement they put into it, they poured really good juju into this film. And I think that's why people are drawn to it. Well, it sounds like a very positive set. And I think when, when your mindset is of a positive nature rather than a negative one, it, it can change things. So that's how it kind of sounds like your entire cast and your crew and where you were at and everything with the story. Marcus, what about you? Was there kind of a moment that you knew that you you got the story, that you told the story that you wanted to tell? I know yours with the music video may be a little different, but you were still telling a story. Yeah. I'd say well after it was finished, once people finally started watching it and liking it. <laughs> um, because like I said, it, it, it came from such a personal place. I knew I was gonna like it. Um, but I didn't know if anyone else was really going to care. Um, and when people not only started watching it, but liked it and then resonated with it, uh, I, had a, I had a few people reach out to me and be like, wow, this, this really embodies what I've gone through. Uh, that, that was what I did. That was what I did. That's good. Okay, so I have two more things. Well, first, one's a comment, and then I have one last question for you guys. So the comment was, and the winner for best chemistry between filmmakers on a big Q&A are you guys. 
Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Virtual high five, guys. <laughs> and the last question that we kind of end up with, we end every Q&A with is, and Evan, I'm going to start with you, is you, you run into me on the street and I haven't seen your film. Can I give me your best one line or elevator pitch saying why I should see your film? Oh, wow. Um... I think it's a, I think you should see my film because it's about a group of people that um, I don't believe have gotten the chance to tell their story. Um, a lot of things are said about the Vietnam War. A lot of judgments are made about the Vietnam War. Um, and I don't think that the people that ultimately fought that war um, have gotten um, their due. And I think it's important to listen to what they have to say um, because I think a lot of what they went through um uh soldiers of today and 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 military of today are going through and um you know if you don't know your history you're doomed to repeat it um so i uh, i think that would be one of the reasons to watch the film that right there that would make me go and watch it <laughs> awesome. sonny what about you I would say watch the film because I'm begging you. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> I would say, <laughs> I'm sorry, sorry. I should take, I'm, I'm taking this serious. I would say because it is one of the more relatable and powerful films you're going to catch this year. And what I mean by relatable is uh, you're going to see a person skirt the line of lines of criminality, but you're also going to do it with that character. And that's the true power of cinema is learning to empathize with characters and situations and people that aren't you, that you've never experienced and that you can't see yourself doing. Um, it is a, my opinion that like true change comes through empathy. It, I believe every lawmaker, my film should be required viewing because until you understand the scenario of the most desperate people on the planet, you should not be passing laws on how to punish them. And if you agree with that, watch my movie. Okay, Marcus, what about you? I would agree with that. I would agree with that for sure. <laughs> and I agree with you back, sir. <laughs> <laughs> so why should someone watch my name? Yeah. Hmm. Someone should watch Binate. I think artists especially should watch Binate because I feel that it tells a universal story about the two binaries that you feel as an artist, at least I feel, uh, feeling like you're on top of the world, your art is amazing, and you're so great at what you do, and then everything you do sucks, and you're, you're worthless, and there's no point to what you make. Um, and you might as well just give up. Um, the intersection of those two feelings is what I try to convey through Binate, paired with the utterly beautiful music by Para Forkuba. He's a uh, German electronic artist that I just adore with all my being, and to be able to use his song paired with that message. If you're an artist and you like beautiful music and, and you like feeling something and you want to relate, to a, a universal message, uh, you should watch my name. And mic drop. That was awesome. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, I want to thank each one of you for coming on today. We're kind of at the, the hour mark here. So thank you, all of you. And Jimmy, thank you for moderating. Thank you all for coming on. Thank you for allowing us to share your work with our audience. Um, and you guys, for anybody that's watching, you know, for our, here and on Facebook, you still have a couple more days to go out and watch these films. So please do so. And we will talk to you guys later. Thank you. Sabrina. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Bye.